Good morning, good afternoon and evening, everyone. I wanna thank you for joining us for the launch of an event of a governance befitting humanity and the path toward a just global order. My name is Juan Pacheco. I will serve as your master of ceremonies uh, for the duration of this session. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you on the eve of, Nash of the United Nations Day, which is on Saturday, making this an auspicious occasion uh, to question and explore what it is that humanity today needs out of its global governance structures. So today's event will feature both live and pre-recorded contributions. Let me thank all of those who have been kind enough to uh, submit video responses while not all of them could be used in the interest of time. Uh, we hope that what we've compiled will be thought provoking. Uh, there will be a dedicated website in the near future where the full length videos could be found. So the structure for the next hour, there's gonna be a brief summary of the four sections of the document, um, each followed by contributions that we have uh, received by a video submission and also uh, one live intervention per section. At the end of the hour, we will open the floor for a discussion for about 30 minutes. We chose this format uh, because this statement is meant to not serve as a, a set of policy proposals or even a definitive roadmap uh, to a better future. It's meant to foster discussion and hopefully serve as a springboard uh, for new ideas and, and approaches. So with that being said, let's get a few uh, logistical details. Uh, the event is being live streamed on various platforms and recorded. So by participating, you're acknowledging your consent to your image and your uh, likeness or voice possibly uh, being recorded. So you are of course also most welcome to use uh, the comments in the chat box. And we hope that that space can serve uh, as a nice opportunity for some interaction and reflection. For those that are joining via Facebook or Twitter, welcome. Uh, you can also chat there as we'll be following those uh, comments and feedback as well. So after the first hour is over, as I mentioned, those on Zoom will have an opportunity to engage in a short discussion. If you're interested in contributing, please indicate that in the chat box. And I think that's all the housekeeping. So shall we begin? Uh, I hope I see some, hopefully there's some smiling faces behind these screens, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ms. Bonnie Dougal the principal representative of the Baha'i International Communities United Nations Office. So after a brief video introduction to the statement, uh, she will provide some historical context uh, for the document and a summary uh, of the first section. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this event on the Baha'i International Community's Statement, a governance befitting humanity and the path toward a just global order, which is being launched on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations.
Advancement of international governance has been a concern of the Baha'i faith since its founding in the mid 1800s. Baha'u'llah wrote for the need for an all embracing assemblage at which rulers and kings of the earth must consider such ways and means as will lay the foundations of the world's great peace amongst men. With the founding of the League of Nations, Baha'is begin to establish more formal relations with international organizations. Over the past 75 years, the Baha'i international community has supported and contributed to UN efforts in the areas of social and sustainable development, gender equality, human rights, and UN reform, among others. The notion that every nation, community, and person has a part to play in building a peaceful and prosperous global society is central to our work. The Baha'i international community represents the worldwide Baha'i community whose members come from every national, ethnic, religious, cultural, and socioeconomic background, representing a cross-section of humanity. The Baha'i international community has offices at the UN in New York and Geneva, representations to the UN's regional hubs, and also has established offices in Addis Ababa, Brussels, and Jakarta. Viewing global advancement primarily through the lens of capacity building, the Baha'i community seeks the empowerment of increasingly larger section, segments of humanity to work effectively toward the spiritual and material betterment of all. Towards this end, we offer insights from the Baha'i teachings and the experience of the worldwide Baha'i community. Learning to put those insights into practice in support of efforts to address global challenges. This statement for the 75th anniversary follows others that we shared at the 10th, 50th and 60th anniversaries of the United Nations. It arrives amidst a deepening appreciation of humanity's interconnectedness and interdependence. The human race stands on the threshold of its maturity, having passed through its collective stages of infancy and childhood. Yet, as humanity moves from its state of adolescence, a global order that unifies the nations with the ascent of humanity is the only adequate answer to the destabilizing forces that threaten the world. World unity is not only possible, it is inevitable. However, it cannot be achieved without unreserved acceptance of the oneness of humankind. Indeed, recent developments are ushering humanity to this realization. For instance, disruptions associated with the pandemic are opening many possibilities for marked social change. Periods of turbulence have always presented opportunities to redefine collective values and assumptions. And the coming 25 years to the centenary of the UN are critical in determining the fortunes of humanity. Decisive steps are urgently needed in establishing enduring universal peace. Whether peace is to be reached only after unimaginable horrors precipitated by humanity's stubborn clinging to old patterns of behavior, or is to be embraced now by an act of consultative will, is the choice before all who inhabit the earth. We have received some recorded messages in response to our statement and we'll play these collections throughout our program today. Let's watch the first few now.
in the uncertain times we are living in and with the global challenges affecting us all, the spirit of United Nations to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security is more valid than ever. It is the best fruit of humanity. The statement, a governance pathing, humanity and the path toward a just global order reminds us about the history. It implies how long and tortuous the way was, lead through a series of victories and reverses to the political unification of nations as of today. Its course is definitely a powerful instrument to provide perspective on the past, but no less important that its direction casts a light on the future. This year, we are all commemorating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, and we are doing it in turbulent times. Actually, this year is the first time in the history of the United Nations where the opening of the United Assembly has taken place virtually. This reality is very challenging. For us, for diplomats, the personal encounter is the essence of our work because through that personal encounter, we build trust, and through trust, we reach agreement, and we forge the global coalitions that we need to give answers to the global challenges. I know that that idea of the global coalitions is very much embedded in the messages of the Baha'i community. And I want to focus on the importance of religious actors in forging those global coalitions. Their role is very important in areas such as development, education, health, and so on. As we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, our global community faces growing risk and complex challenges. They threaten to derail or even reverse sustainable development and hinder achievement of the 2030 Agenda. The science is clear. Natural hazards are increasing in frequency and intensity, and a climate calamity looms. Ecosystems are collapsing, biodiversity is diminishing, poverty is again rising, hatred is spreading, geopolitical tensions are escalating, and transformative technologies have opened new opportunities, but also new threats. Is international cooperation still a desirable goal for many governments? Could be the question we could ask. Climate change, the problems of human rights, the problems of gender equality, the decline of democracy, all of these issues now pose major threats to international cooperation and indeed the future of humanity. The UN needs to be there, but it needs to be reformed. It needs to somehow be more effective. The United Nations remains the largest forum. Uh, it brings together 193 countries to give expression to humanity's common will, to quote from the statement, but then they go on and say that the current arrangements are no longer sufficient. And to me, um, this is a very accurate reflection of the kind of world that we live in today. Um, and I, again, here, I wanna give you a few examples. Well, one that comes to mind, of course, is the global financial crisis in 2009, which showed how uh, regulation and prudential oversight of the financial system was deeply flawed. And as a result of that, you know, we had a near implosion of the global financial system. Um, that in turn has precipitated some, some uh, uh, reforms in the system. And at least as of now, although as they say, touch wood, you know, th this economic crisis precipitated by, by COVID, you know, has not, has not uh, sort of transmuted into a financial crisis yet. And, and we certainly hope that it won't. Um, a second example has to do with our approach to managing climate change, um, which is, you know, I think is recognized as being the most important challenge facing uh, the world today, but where governments have essentially adopted an architecture that is very flawed, um, consisting of uncoordinated voluntary arrangements, which in, involve a, a lot of free riding and, and, and are just not working, not working. And then of course, a third example is rising inequality, uh, which, which is it, 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 uh, sort of manifesting itself in many parts of the world in increasing levels of social and political unrest. And, and, and so these are examples to me, which I think very clearly, very eloquently highlight the point illustrated in the statement that
that refers to this gap. And I think the main issue at the heart of it is that we have to recognize that we are one. Uh, we have to recognize that one part of, of the world affects another and that in essence we are just uh, one family. I think the current pandemic, a typical communicable disease, uh, began in one part of the world and then um, within weeks it enveloped the entire globe and um, that has really shown to us that what can happen in one place in a remote part of what I think is the world within weeks can also affect my life and so for me that is the, the biggest uh, sort of realization that has come that we are just one and that we are just one family. We now turn to Professor Colette Mazzuccelli from the NYU School of Arts and Sciences. Colette is also Senior Vice President of Academia at the Global Listening Center. And we ask Colette to share her perspectives. Thank you, dearest Bonnie, for the invitation to speak today to the statement of the Baha'i International Community. Greetings colleagues and friends from around our world, from Monroe Township, New Jersey. As an educator with students presently living, studying and working around our globe in this time of COVID-19, these words in the Baha'i statement resonate strongly. True acknowledgement of global interdependence requires genuine concern for all without distinction. Deceptively simple, this principle implies a profound reordering of priorities. As Professor Spivak explains, the university is not an NGO. Its vocation is teaching and learning, scholarship and research, service to society. In this unprecedented fall 2020 semester of virtual learning for so many in the profession, we heed the call to reach out and to listen to those organizations with which we may partner to bring necessary insights into our classroom without borders, namely the lessons of care for the homeless, the homeless who have yet to be holistically nurtured in our shared homeland. As we begin a partnership with the Syrian Emergency Task Force, SETF, this fall, our goal is to understand the nature of its engagement on the ground in Syria and to support that engagement in ways that relate to our learning on behalf of the one society in diversity that we most aspire to become. Our focus in this context is on the SETF work with the Tomorrow's Dawn Women's Center in war-torn Idlib province in northwestern Syria where video conference technology is used to connect the women in Syria and a physician in the United States, Dr. Zahir, who provides education about the coronavirus, focusing on how to remain safe in these most challenging times. Women are key in Syrian society. They educate orphaned children, which is the most important type of work to nurture the vulnerable in society. How do our students, we may ask, take the responsibility to support the SETF engagement, initially in their experiential programs of study and subsequently in their professional lives? The priority we set is to respond to this question with practical initiatives that make a qualitative difference in the lives of the children. Our goal is also to cooperate with the SETF in the Wisdom House Kindergarten now displaced in the Aleppo countryside near the Turkish-Syria border to support the Syrians through providing a school which offers education for children without indoctrination in English and Arabic, as well as geography, science, and math, while providing mental health support and sustenance. This work is also being accomplished for teachers and their families, all in coordination with the local council. This process, which at its heart is educating orphans, provides yet another way to fulfill the university's vocation. We acknowledge these responsibilities, 
during a fragile time of interconnectedness throughout our world in the spirit of the prophet's words. As Baha'u'llah declared, words must be supported by deeds, for deeds are the true test of words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colette, for those words and for bringing in the real examples from Syria. I now hand the mic back to you, Juan, to take us into the next segment of the program. Thank you very much, Vani and Colette, and all those who have submitted videos thus far. Uh, I would like to turn your attention uh, straight away to Simin Fahandej, who serves as the representative of the Baha'i International Community in the Geneva office. And she's going to take us through the second section of uh, the document on the oneness of humanity. Okay, Simin. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, there are various uh, very important ideas contained in the statement, which um, Bonnie, uh, yourself, and others have, have touched on. Um, but the second section of the statement uh, is about a theme which is really at the heart of the entire statement, and that is the concept of the oneness of humankind, um, as we've seen uh, throughout um, the event uh, today. The document states that throughout history, uh, periods of turbulence have presented the international community um, with opportunities to redefine and also to uh, determine the collective values which will guide and shape um, efforts at every level of society. And one concept that the document suggests requires uh, deep reflection at this time in history is the idea of the oneness of humanity. Um, and while the true meaning of this idea are, um, in all its dimensions are manifold, the document states that acknowledging uh, the concept of the oneness of humanity uh, does not call for uniformity or renouncing the many established uh, systems of governance and culture that exist uh, in the world today, but rather a true appreciation of the concept actually requires uh, this essential concept of diversity and also a consensus um, that it's possible to preserve diversity uh, while accepting um, a set of common values and principles that can attract the support of nations around the world. Uh, in fact, it requires um, a framework that accommodates uh, a diversity of approaches and is built on a commitment to unity and a shared ethic of um, justice, uh, which allows um, a common principles to be put into practice in many different ways and different approaches and arrangements. Uh, the document also states that um, a measure of agreement around shared principles can already be seen in the ideals that inform global agendas, such as the universality of human rights, the imperative to er eradicate poverty, and many other similar uh, ideals and frameworks that we see at the international stage today. Um, another important concept um, or aspect of oneness, uh, which the statement highlights, is the implications of this concept for policymaking. So in one place, uh, the statement says, as uh, Colette also uh, referred to it regarding the principle of oneness, uh, it says, and I quote, deceptively simple, this principle implies a profound reordering of priorities. Too often advancement of the common good is approached as a secondary objective, commendable, but to be pursued only after other narrower national interests have been secured. This must change for the welfare of any segment of humanity is inextricably bound up with the welfare of the whole. And so it talks about how the starting point for any consultation on any program or policy must be considering how these policies uh, can impact other segments of society. And the idea that policymakers and leaders are confronted with this critical question um, when considering the merits of any uh, proposed action whether it's local, national, or international. And the question is, will this decision advance the good of humankind in its entirety? So I guess this makes us think if the concept of the oneness of humanity becomes the pivoting principle for all of our efforts, and if such questions are asked when considering policies um, and policy making, what will our current national and global policies and agendas look like uh, going forward? Um, so with these um, comments and questions, uh, we can now hear a few responses uh, to this section. Um, they are pre-recorded statements that have been made. 
To me, reading the statement of International Baha'i Community for United Nations anniversary felt like a breeze of fresh air. It has the needed perspective, the one that shows everything as is. It's true, powerful, inspiring. With all the turmoil happening around us practically in all aspects of life, social, political, economic, environmental, you can't help but wonder, is there an exit from the impasse the mankind put itself into. And probably one dimension of life, spiritual, is a needed ingredient that is lacking from the recipe of the remedy that we all must take in order to bring about the needed salvation. Yes, nowadays we're powered immensely by technology and the tech advancements will only grow exponentially with time. However, if we don't catch up with a spiritual growth, the limitless possibilities that could come from the unimagined before interconnectedness of the human life could do us more harm than cure. Of course, the materialistic side of the human nature will tend to prevail, and this is a challenge that we must overcome together by acknowledging that there is more to life than endless rush towards luxury and comfort at the expense of well-being of other fellow human beings that recognizing the world as one family could nothing but help us in growing advanced models of social and economic cooperation that could eradicate extreme forms of poverty. Let us simply remember that we're all fruits of one tree, leaves of one branch, flowers of one garden. Let's embrace our differences as the foundation for our diversity, because at the core, we're all members of one human family and we all wish only the best for the world. The acknowledgement, the recognition, the necessity of serving the fact that we are all one. We are all one and we cannot exist separately from one another. That for one of us to thrive at the expense of the other is for all of us to lose and lose deeply. Our survival on this planet, the planet's survival, is fundamentally dependent on whether or not we will get this very simple fact deep into our systems. We must work together. We survive only together. We thrive when we are one. We self-destruct when we think that our own boundaries, whether national, institutional, organizational, religious, gender, whatever, we self-destruct when we believe that our boundaries matter. Every individual is unique and every race and nation has a unique contribution to make in producing the rich variety of humanity. Every man, woman, and child suffers, loves, hopes, fears, and aspires. We are all capable, whatever our race, nationality, religion, or class, of sacrifice and service of joy and sadness. The good news is that many approaches are exploring the foundations of cooperative and pro-social behaviors and provide insights on how such behaviors can be encouraged. We're basically dealing with challenges that for the first time affect every single one of us around the world. The truth is that all matters related to the environment, the economy and society in general do affect us all. But up until some months ago, most of us were, for the most part, passive bystanders, hoping that someone somehow would solve these problems. The pandemic has made us realize that we all must work together, even though it is still not clear how, mostly because our worldview is so fractured and divided that it is hard to decipher how to put everything together for the well being of all. If we realize that no one has the answer, but that we do have all the resources we need. If we accept that we are all one big family, apply the principle of consultation under the assumption that within this great diversity of talents and abilities, together we can find sustainable solutions. And if we put the well being of all first and not just our own interest, we can then move forward into a more organic system of governance, community, and economics. And it's, it's a unity that, that, that embraces diversity, uh, diversity of, of, of national, um, legal, cultural, 
um, and, and political traditions, but, but situates it within, within uh, 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 an ethical basis that, that uh, uh, reminds us of, of, of um, some of the, the, the shared values that, that are uh, intrinsic to, to humans everywhere. Uh, an acknowledgement of interdependence, um, a shared ethic of, of, of justice uh, that, that, that people seek everywhere, and a recognition of, of humanity as one. Um, the statement also recognizes that that the transformation that 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 is ongoing is a is a gradual uh, process. It's a step by step process, but every step makes another step possible. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful statements. Um, I now introduce uh, Mr. Ricardo Morrow. Uh, the co-chair of the Global Call to Action Against Poverty uh, from the floor to say a few words about the statement. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think I, sh I can add uh, too much uh, to what has uh, already been said uh, about oneness. Uh, the word oneness uh, recall the idea of harmony of uh, unity or unity of uniqueness uh, and of uh, one family that uh, again that immediately recalls again uh, the idea of cooperation of sharing and so uh, someone said in the video we won't survive uh, if not uh, together and i think that this is again the the old refrain the old truth of uh, saying that uh, everyone is my brother, to feel like brother. But what I can say uh, today is uh, just a few words on, uh, um, how can I say, the risk, the danger, the situation where uh, building uh, harmony is difficult. Um, that is that human, uh, humankind uh, 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 has an history of war, of conflicts, of violence. Um, of physical violence uh, and uh, if uh, we have maybe less uh, physical wars as we had with world war two or three or one or two uh, in the past uh, we have a different kind of violence uh, that is verbal violence uh, that is uh, populism uh, that is hate uh, disrespect uh, that is uh, spreading all over the world uh, uh, not only in politics. And I think that this is a very strong risk that is able to undermine uh, the idea of building a oneness. Uh, so what can we do to, um, to resist to this kind of uh, degeneration? We can uh, give an answer that again uh, uses the strength but I think that uh, we have different tools. And one tool, of course, is a tool of uh, human rights. Um, trying to say that we, instead of using the law of force, we should use the force of law. And strengthening the rule of law and the use of the rule of law uh, all over the world. And, uh, but I would add another, another element, uh, that is the experience of uh, restorative justice. I don't know how much, how familiar you are with the idea of restorative justice. It's an idea of justice based on the idea of relationship. That is, injustice is when uh, a relation is broken. When I steal something or when I kill someone, of course I am uh, breaking the relation I have with him or with her. Uh, but I'm not only destroying that relation, I am undermining also the relation of trust that is shared by all the community. Um, so what does uh, restorative justice say? It says that we should build the justice, building again, build again justice, building again relations. There is making the victim and the and the actor of the of the injustice meeting again together and speaking and knowing each other and re 
recognizing uh, each other. I don't want to speak too long, but uh, this is the experience that have been done in uh, South Africa for with the reconstruction, the reconciliation of truth and reconciliation uh, commission. It is an experience that I come from Italy. We had in uh, after World War II, when we wrote the constitution, we didn't divide the country in two, uh, friends and enemies. We said, we want to work together. So my message uh, today is that uh, uh, maybe it's easy to speak about the oneness, but we face every day the difficulty to leave it really. And so, we should stubbornly look for meeting the enemy. We should not divide the world in we and them, but try to, I repeat, stubbornly meet even who offended me. Understand if I am offended someone and meeting who offend me. I think this is a very strong uh, political tool. And this is what uh, South Africa experience teach us, teaches us. I think that uh, using the weapon of culture and of education to um, see the idea of justice through this dimension of uh, relations uh, can be really uh, effective. And I see, I think that United Nations in this uh, anniversary uh, and religions can play an absolutely important role in this uh, perspective, helping in building path of reconciliation instead of uh, uh, assisting to the spreading of uh, violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Ricardo, for the interesting comments and the uh, pertinent examples. Um, I will now uh, turn it back to uh, Juan, who will uh, take us through the rest of the program. Thank you, uh, Simin and Aw and Ricardo for those wonderful reflections uh, on the section of oneness. Uh, we'll now turn to Dan Perel. Uh, Dan serves as a representative of the Baha'i International Community in the New York office, and will take us through the third section on UN reform. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much, Juan, and good day to everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be sharing this event with you all and, and excited to be presenting some framing for this third section of the statement, which focuses not only on the types of reform that we may wish to consider as a global community, but perhaps more importantly, the appropriate posture necessary in order to build consensus around these reforms. To start with, <clears throat> at this moment in history, we must recognize that what was once viewed as a merely idealistic vision of international cooperation has actually become a pragmatic necessity. But in order for the system to be effective, the patterns of stalemate and impasse, these have to be relinquished in favor of a global civic ethic. Deliberative processes need to be more magnanimous, reasoned and cordial, motivated not by attachment to entrenched positions and narrow interests, but by a collective search for deeper understanding of complex issues. Objectives incompatible with the common good need to be set aside. This means that rather than focusing solely on measurable outcomes and agreements, beneficial though they are, really a process-oriented approach to progress is also needed, building on strengths and responding to evolving realities iteratively. A range of reforms should be considered, and some are in fact mentioned in the statement itself, but these will only find their ultimate success when a dispassionate inquiry into given proposals is present. Any reform would need general consensus in favor to win acceptance and legitimacy. In other words, the less unity there is behind a given reform, the less likely it is to be effective in the long run. And that said, no reform in itself is sufficient to meet the needs of such a complex body of humanity. But to the degree that they would improve on what exists today, each could can contribute to a transformative process of development. And so we have to come to this recognizing that the world envisioned by the international community has still never existed. And in this sense, we're all at an equal starting point. Therefore, progress toward global goals calls for experimentation, search, innovation, creativity, and really setting aside attitudes of paternalism. Moreover, advancement requires increasing fidelity to the moral framework that's already in the charter itself, the UN charter that is. For only as respect for international law, the upholding of human rights, adherence to treaties and agreements, only as these are honored in practice, 
can the UN and its member states demonstrate a standard of integrity and trustworthiness necessary to meet this moment? No amount of administrative reorganization will suffice otherwise. For as Baha'u'llah said, let deeds, not words, be your adorning. So now let's hear a few responses uh, to this section. As the statement of the Baha'i International Community points to, it is time for us to take two crucial steps in tandem. The first is that we must identify and agree upon a set of global ethics, starting with the oneness of nations and people. We must then use these global ethics to build a system of global governance that includes collective decision-making institutions, such as a directly elected global parliamentary assembly, essentially a world legislature, that is fit to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. There is a need for collective action to better understand the systemic nature of risk. The need to build resilience and achieve sustainable development has never been greater. We have tools and agreements, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which guide our individual and collective actions. But we need to accelerate our action and manage this transition. We need to shift from managing single hazards to improve understanding of the dynamic interactions with systemic risks. This requires avoiding unsustainable economic growth at the expense of declining ecological life. And we need to look not only back at past trends, but also forward on how factors such as climate change and demographic changes expand our topography of risks. Only when we realize uh, what common principles people share, um, common humanity, uh, can we come to grips with the big problems like the pandemic and climate change and many, many other issues that nationalism, building walls, borders, um, to stop uh, public bads from coming into our country. They're highly ineffective and short-sighted, and it's only through um, transnational cooperation that we can come to grips uh, with the major challenges of our time. Everybody has their own definitions of a global civic ethic. It's great to see it referred to in a governance befitting. Um, I think basic principles dealing with rights and responsibilities of all human beings are at the heart of a notion of a global civic ethic. Um, certainly a peaceful and secure life is uh, top of many people's list. Um, the ability to participate in governance and not just within our own communities or at the national level, but at all levels, the notion of contributing to the common good, but also um, the importance of um, seeing the environmental impact that our actions have ethical moral principles that underpin these institutions, that's at the heart of a global civic ethic. And um, in terms of concrete ways, though, that people can participate and share these uh, ethical uh, uh, principles in governance discussions, I think two of the most interesting are related to um, reform ideas that have been circulating since the foundation of the United Nations, a parliamentary assembly, um, often seen as a possible second chamber to the current General Assembly, which is made up of member states, but to have our own elected officials. Initially, these could be parliamentarians from our own national legislatures, but uh, giving uh, people a voice by having a representative that they would choose alongside uh, diplomats uh, representing uh, governments would ensure more diverse opinions, more um, of a connection uh, overcoming what is often criticized as a democratic deficit. And it's not just creating bodies with uh, legislative representatives that would be important, but strengthening the linkages with civil society, with the private sector, other non-state actors to participate in the work of the United Nations, that it's not just the domain of governments to be able to uh, determine what our uh, society's goals and priorities and what actions will be taken they all have something to contribute. So to be participating directly in policymaking and implementation is an area that I think can also help advance the notion of a global civic ethic in global governance. And because combining all those different sectors and actors in a common space will provide a holistic way of seeing the reality of a country or the reality of what is happening. By having only government, 
It's good, but it's only giving one aspect of what is happening. It's not a reality of what is happening in the, in the in a country level or even at a regional level. But having that space in the United Nations will really allow that. And of course, will also re- uh, allow the United Nations to learn and progress through different crises and problems that the world has been, uh, uh, is facing on how the government itself contributing on that uh, transformation and helping the learning from the um, the learning from the the different crises and the different problems to ensure that by addressing that they enhance and uh, developing uh, the sense of uh, a unity among the different countries and of, among the different actors as well of, of global development. With both the pandemic and the environment showing that those living in poverty are at the greatest risk. We cannot afford to be indifferent to the suffering of so many. As the statement points out, this requires a process-oriented approach to progress. Too much of the present global system of environmental governments is voluntary. Even the commitments under the Paris Agreement are far from adequate to, to save us from global climate catastrophe. The statement is quite specific, and I quote, strengthening the legal framework relating to the natural world would lend coherence and vigor to the biodiversity, climate, and environmental regimes and provide a robust foundation for a system of common stewardship of the planet's resources. In fact, perhaps this is an area with the most potential to make a breakthrough in global governance. Creating a mechanism globally for climate change might increase trust and lay the foundation for wider efforts to renew peace in the world. Thank you so much once again to all of our contributors for those excellent remarks. And we will have the, the full length clips one day, hopefully on a, on a website for those who are interested in seeing the little bits that perhaps got cut out. Um, but now I have the, the privilege of introducing my, my colleague, my friend, uh, Jeff Huffreins from UN 2020 to offer some of his reflections on this particular section of, of the, the statement. Uh, Jeff, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm honored to be a part of this discussion. So as these powerful recorded statements reflect, the Baha'i statement boldly suggests that there are a range of areas in which established systems and approaches are in need of radical transformation. However, before we can arrive at a consensus for policy solutions that would effectuate such a transformation, we must first consider ways in which we may transform the current political environment in which we as an international community now operate. In point of fact, we are living in an extremely polarized time whereby endemic political partisanship can so completely divide a country's leadership and citizens that its ability to achieve a consensus on domestic and foreign policy issues becomes ever more elusive, thereby damaging the country's credibility on the international front. This hyperpartisan discourse is further distorted and amplified through various disinformation campaigns engineered by both state and non-state actors through social media designed to maximize personal outrage and shock against uh, the demonized other, thereby short-circuiting any possibility of civilized discourse between and among diverse constituencies, and in particular, political parties responsible for policy decision-making creating further divisions within and among communities and nations. What I find particularly compelling is that there are elements of this statement that demonstrate how we as responsible national and global citizens can help resolve societal controversies and problems by first identifying foundational principles to arrive at common solutions, thereby cutting through the hyper-partisan discourse of our times. As was discussed in the last segment, the statement speaks to the fact that a measure of agreement around shared principles and norms can already be discerned in the ideals that inform global agendas, tools, and frameworks, such as Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, among other global agreements, but this fact alone is not enough. Significantly, the statement goes on to say that what is required is a framework that accommodates a diversity of approaches built on a commitment to unity and a shared ethic of justice, as was stated, a global civic ethic. 
which would allow common principles to be put into practice through intergovernmental processes. The third section of this statement affirms that such a posture reinforces a process-oriented approach to progress, building gradually on strengths and responding to evolving realities. And it is by developing this collective capacity for reasoned and dispassionate inquiry into the merits of any given proposal that a range of UN reforms that can then be considered for further deliberation, as was mentioned a UN Parliamentary Assembly, a World Council on Future Affairs, the reform of the Security Council, among other proposals. Indeed, the UN 75 People's Declaration and Plan for Global Action adopted by civil society advocates last May calls for immediate actions that reflects the urgency of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement, especially in light of the ongoing pandemic, such as full funding of the UN, as well as proposing medium-term proposals and long-term aspirations that includes the appointment of a high-level champion for civil society at the UN, upgrading the peace-building commission into a peace-building council and the establishment of a UN par parliamentary assembly. So in conclusion, to quote from the UN 75 People's Declaration, confronting global challenges requires a fundamental shift in thinking about humanity's relationship to the earth, true wealth, progress, development, the role and nature of power and governance, and the essential values of humanity. Solutions will be found through a commitment to a new posture of collaboration, innovation, and action. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Jeff. As always, so articulate and clear. We are very grateful to you for, for those reflections. Uh, and with that, I, I will turn the floor back over to Juan to take us on to the next transition. Juan? Thank you, Dan and Jeffrey and everyone again so far who has submitted those videos. Uh, for our fourth section, we're going to go back to Simin, who will start uh, the discussion about uh, looking forward, the coming years and decades and implications of this uh, document. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, so the last section of the document is actually quite short, um, but it talks about the vision um, for the future and the immense opportunity uh, that the concluding years of the UN's first century presents us with. Um, collaboration, it says, is possible on unprecedented scales and the failure to establish such global cooperation risks consequences that could be catastrophic. Um, so the statement calls on the community of nations to ensure that the machinery of international politics and power are directed towards cooperation and unity. And it ultimately asks um, the question that at the centenary of the UN, uh, would it not be possible for humanity to be confident that we have set in motion a realistic process for building the global order we need to sustain progress in the coming centuries? Um, and it finally ends with a few words uh, from Baha'u'llah uh, which are addressed to the leaders of the world and it states let them take counsel together and through anxious and full deliberation administer to a diseased and sorely afflicted world the remedy it required um, so with these uh, final comments uh, about the last section uh, it's a good time to again hear a few remarks um, and reflections about this section of the document <laughs> Uh, the first thing that really leaps out to me is the notion of human possibility and capability. There's a thread also a very, very positive vision uh, for humanity and for our uh, ability to solve our global challenges that runs throughout the document. It highlights also we, we have this capacity to make good choices, <laughs> to take, take a very positive path. If we collectively really fundamentally and finally at last <laughs> understand our commonality as a really interdependent global community that embraces all peoples and nations around the world um, that if we if we have this clear acknowledgement of our essential unity as humanity one humanity this opens up a whole new set of possibilities as we start to contemplate uh, these grave challenges and, and very uh, rather existential risks 
And I think this statement gets to the heart of a shift in perspective that can allow us to renew our commitment to the extraordinary core values that are in the UN Charter of 1945. For example, to quote again for the preamble, to practice tolerance and to live uh, together side by side in peace with one another as good neighbors. Imagine if we really practiced that at the international level and really took that to heart, um, not only to reaffirm our commitment to the principles in the charter, as you note in the statement, but then also, as you note, to prepare ourselves for the processes of rethinking our current global governance infrastructure in a more technical and concrete way. Uh, if we do begin to think in these different ways that are put forth by the statement, uh, you could even say that success, global success, becomes inevitable. <laughs> As an international lawyer, I, of course, applaud the affirmations in the statement of the importance of the nations of the world upholding the rule of law, and in particular, the treaties and other forms of legal obligation that have protected human rights, that seek to protect our natural environment. It is essential that governments faithfully fulfill those legal obligations if we are to achieve human rights as well as a safer and more sustainable environment. And yet at the same time, we recognize that those legal obligations will not amount to anything unless they are supported by a clear ethical commitment. And so this is also an auspicious time to reaffirm the ideal of the unity of nations and the unity of the human family that we find at the core of the UN Charter and of the mission of the United Nations. Now we need a third generation international organization, which can be a much stronger United Nations. We need global institutions that can really meet the global challenges. We need global democracy, where all people can have a say in how the world is governed. We need respect for human rights, for people of all races and colors, refugees and migrants everywhere. We need development to create capacity, not dependency. We need disarmament to divert as little of our world's resources, both human and physical, to antagonism, aggression, or militarism. We need enforceable international law where we pool our common resources to, for peacekeeping, peace enforcement, and making sure that international law is respected. In this way, we can move forward towards the long cherished dream of a world with peace and justice. But if we believe from the principles of multilateralism, we must understand that we embody those principles, that in order for the United Nations to thrive, civil society has to come together to thrive. That one will not exist without the other. The multilateral system will not exist without civil society. Civil society will not be safeguarded and supported and consolidated without the multilateral system. It is like our body and our nature. We cannot destroy one and think the other will survive. There is a very close interconnectivity between our bodies, ourselves, and our nature, as there is a very close interconnectivity between the civil society and the multilateral society. And therefore, the message on this that has been articulated on this 75th anniversary of this amazing faith tradition that continues to serve all, regardless, the messages work together, serve together. I think it, it leaves me with, with a feeling of wanting to find ways in which I can share this with my colleagues. And of course, I work in a policy space uh, whereby we represent our government in, in different international platforms, whereby we advance our, our national positions. But I think our national positions are not good enough anymore. We need to be able to advance this kind of, of message that looks at the earth as one country, uh, that looks at, uh, as, 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 um, at, uh, looks at 
processes and systems that we need to collaborate and coordinate together as a one human race, as one family. So that is how it feels me, uh, uh, how I feel about this message, but also most importantly, it leaves me with a lot of hope. Uh, a lot of hope in the sense that uh, we are just going through another stage of the ever advancing civilization of humanity where we have crises and victories and the, the crisis will propel us further to our victory and which is undoubtedly our um, destiny of the oneness of, of humankind uh, whereby the earth is but one country and that we are just all here as our brothers and sisters. This statement is an open and welcoming invitation to elevate our vision from our presumed limitations to a wider realization of our purpose at this particular time in the history of humankind. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to introduce to you uh, Professor uh, Charlotte Bunch, the founding director and senior scholar at the Center for Women's Global Leadership, uh, for a few comments uh, on the statement as well. Please go ahead, dear Charlotte. Thank you very much. And I welcome this statement. I think the vision is very important, uh, particularly the holistic vision um, that comes with this statement and the way in which it is based on values of human rights, justice, equality, and peace. Um, as a participant in the UN World Women's Conferences, we also learned that these are not separable, that in fact, we can't have one without the others. And I think too often, gender and sexual equality, and even racial equality are viewed as secondary, as somehow coming after we establish the rest. But I would urge us to think about, we can never reach peace even restorative justice or the oneness of humanity when at the core of our society, in our local communities and in our families, we are still teaching children inequality. And we teach children inequality and violence through the ways in which we perpetuate violence against women, violence against racial groups that are not our own or the other. Uh, and this happens well over one third of the world's women have experienced such violence. And I would say well over one third of the world's peoples who are minorities or in other ways marginalized experience violence in the home, in the family, in the local community. And this does not, this is not separate from the violence of militarism, from the peace and oneness we seek. For if we are teaching children at a very young age that this is a winner loser world, a world based on violence where their future depends on this kind of discrimination and violence, then we are not building the core values that this statement is calling us to. So I would just say that as we begin to work toward this and I, I affirm all of the values, we remember that oneness, the understanding that we are all human, the understanding that we are all equal, begins at home. And by home, I don't just mean the family, I mean in the community, at the local level, because that's where the dynamics of power and discrimination against women, against others who are marginal, against racial minorities begins. So I think governments must begin to address this connection of our community life and our family life in relation to our governing structures in a much more powerful way. We have words to say this in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Rights of Women, the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, but those principles are not being taught at the core level of our societies. And without those principles, we can't reach the oneness that we all uh, uh, want to move toward. So I would just end by saying, this vision is a really remarkable vision. I like the statement that it's not just idealistic, it's a necessity, but it's a necessity that must reach down to very core elements of our society. And as Bella Abza used to say, in the UN, we have the words, now we need the music. I think the music is the practice that you are calling us to, and maybe we can all 
uh, think about how to enhance that at every level. Thank you very much for this visionary moment. Thank you very much, dear Charlotte, for your comments. Uh, I will now turn back to Juan to take us uh, to the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Simin, and thank you, Charlotte, uh, for that final section. Um, I have the pleasure of making our final transition. Uh, this time, we're gonna go back to Dan Perel, who's gonna close out our session by facilitating an open discussion. I know, uh, as we mentioned before, you can utilize the Q&A uh, or the chat box if you want to uh, contribute or you have something to offer. It has truly, truly uh, been my, my honor to be here with you. I've learned so much, I feel inspired. As uh, Charlotte uh, just said, um, as a father of three young boys, it starts in the home and in the community. And I live in a, in a thriving black community and there's a lot of potential. And uh, there's something from the writings that I wanna share on a personal note that says to be worthy of the trust of thy neighbor and to look upon him with a bright and friendly face. And I think that's something that we can all uh, as we step back into our, our, our lives and our worlds, of course, at a safe distance, we can shine uh, that love towards our neighbors and all those that cross our path. Uh, thank you again so much. I look forward to seeing how uh, these endeavors can, can further advance um, humanity. Uh, again, thank you uh, for the privilege of being here uh, to help facilitate this. And we go uh, to Dan Perel so he can take you away with the uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you for, for adding that lovely quote and reminder for how we should, how we should be in the world uh, with each, each moment of our lives, not just uh, when we're out in public or when we are uh, in, in our private lives. It's really a, a full thing that we're looking to, to do. Um, and we're looking to governments to, to help us in this process as well. So uh, as we have mentioned, I, I hope a few times, this event is really meant to be the beginning of a process of deeper exploration. Uh, likely in smaller groups, knowing how challenging it can be to uh, have deep, profound conversations with uh, over 100 people. Uh, so I'm going to put a note in the chat box for those who are interested in joining any future uh, small group discussions on this topic or, or even others, even others that you might find interesting. I mean, we're, we're all trying to learn how to have these deep conversations in a very strange uh, environment in which we are existing right now. And, we have to sort of use each other for that. So at, at this point, it is uh, for me to open the floor for further remarks. Uh, if you would like to speak, please indicate as much, uh, either by raising your hand in the, as an attendee or by writing to me in the chat box. Um, we do have somebody on the, uh, ready to take the floor now, and I'll just remind uh, you, Tom, and others uh, to please keep your comments brief so that we can have the opportunity to hear from as many uh, participants as possible. Uh, and then there are a couple of questions and answer, well, a couple of questions that have been posed, uh, and perhaps we will try to answer a few of those as well. So over to you, Tom. Well, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thanks. Great, great. So um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished participants from around the world, it is a great honor to speak today at this important event on behalf of the World Jewish Congress. The World Jewish Congress, the representative body of Jewish communities in 100 countries, welcomes the Baha'i International Community's statement and objectives. We believe that the vision has been, that has been presented today is an important milestone in shaping a better and more just future for minorities around the world and for humanity as a whole. On a more personal level, as an individual who grew up in the city of Haifa in Israel, which is the center of the Baha'i international community, I had the opportunity to witness firsthand in my interaction with Baha'i friends and colleagues, how a community that cherishes values such as gender equality, good governance and tolerance, as referred to in the document presented, truly makes a difference not only within the Baha'i community, but rather sends ripples to a wider scale and further circles. We hope that um, every player with a strong sense of commitment for international cooperation will follow the Baha'i international community's example and share from its wisdom and values for the purpose of building a better uh, humanity, particularly 
in current times of major challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. And I, I did forget to introduce you properly as a representative of the World Jewish Congress. It's really wonderful to have you here and to learn that you actually grew up in the, the shadow of the Baha'i World Center. It's, it's so lovely. Um, so thank you. Thank you for those remarks and for joining us. Uh, so I'm not seeing a lot of comments in the chat box uh, request to speak, which is, which is fine, because we actually did receive a number of really good questions. Uh, and I will ask my, my fellow co-panelists if any of them would like to, to touch on, on any. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll read a couple that I found particularly interesting. And, and perhaps we end up just leaving the questions as, uh, out there for further deliberation. So one was, what is the definition of common good? And how will our pursuit of the common good be measured? Uh, another that, was, that, that uh, spoke to me a little bit was when we talk about the responsibility of governments and state actors, as citizens, what are our responsibilities and how do we hold ourselves accountable as well? We do have the power for constructive change. It's not purely reliant upon others. Uh, then there's this, this interesting question on the, on the rule of law uh, in general. Uh, making human rights issues at the, at the center of, of many of these del deliberations, uh, understanding the proper relationship between people and corporations, the role of state sovereignty. Uh, and this is all tied as well to, to this idea of, of responsible investing. And these questions, while very practical, are, are really important to be considering. And then finally, I mean, not finally, I didn't catch everything in the chat, but one other one that, that did uh, catch my attention was this question about self-interest. Uh, how to incentivize enlightened self-interest, or you, you get what you incentivize. Uh, and I think that this question is, is quite interesting uh, to consider in light of sort of the dynamics that we have in, in the world today. So I, I will turn it over, or I will give my co-panelists an opportunity to perhaps chime in if they would like to. But if not, I'm happy to try my best to address a few of them. So I see that the chat box is active, which is excellent. So I'll just answer a couple of these questions to the best of my ability. And I think uh, as the statement articulates, uh, I think a lot of this is actually about the, the underlying values that we approach these, these questions with. Um, it's not just the right policy, it's not just the right actor, but really to understand what these underlying values are. And here's where we get to this definition of a common good. Um, and then how, how would we, measure that. Uh, I think this is, this is a, an open question for, for deliberation. And for the first time, it's actually a deliberation that the whole world needs to engage in. It's not just one segment figuring it out for itself, but because of the interdependence and interconnectivity, we have to be understanding that the implications of what we do in our isolated space has impacts everywhere else. And so this idea of common good really is being taken to a new degree that we haven't uh, quite understood before. And I think that's, that's an open question. And this does get to the idea of, of governments and state actors. Um, and I do see, sorry, that there was a question for Jeff as well. So hopefully we can re-promote Jeff so that he can speak. My apologies. So on this other question about uh, incentivizing self-interest and the role of the individual, uh, I think that's a large part of what we are here to do today is to recognize that we all uh, actually have an important role to play. And there was a, a recent article in an online um, publication about the role, not of the member states, but of civil society. And Aza also spoke quite clearly to it. And that we have to you know, take whatever difference we can make and, 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 and make that change. And I liken this to the, to the field of climate change, where what we see today is the result of billions of decisions made by billions of people. And if we expect one decision or one policy to undo that long history of, of a culture of uh, consumerism, it's not going to be that way. So it's going to take billions of small decisions in response. And so I think we have to stop thinking about the, the savior or the hero or the, the perfect leader or policy that will come and, and rescue us, but start to think about the individual actions we can be taken, taking. And that does mean engaging with our governments. Uh, it does mean engaging with each other. And as Ricardo said earlier, even speaking with those who we may not agree with uh, at first blush. So that's enough uh, chatting from me. Uh, I will give the floor to Jeff now to, to make an intervention. Jeff? Great, uh, 
Thank you so much, Dan. You know, I had put into the chat box a link to this UN 75 People's Declaration. And you'll find in that declaration uh, some reflections uh, on the role of us as individual national and global citizens. Um, there are two sections I think that are relevant. One of them is on creating an enabling environment. And then there's a section on a people's commitment. And they're like two sides of one coin. So in terms of creating an enabling environment, it's, it's really the responsibility of governments to ensure that there is a political environment that enables the whole of society to contribute to sustainable development, to build resilient communities. Some of these uh, conditions for enabling an environment include good governance, promoting peaceful, inclusive societies, promoting dignity and human rights, you know, essential elements of trust, of uh, education, sustainability, prosperity. But uh, that, uh, that enabling environment um, that is buttressed by uh, governments upholding uh, our human rights of, 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 of association, of expression, uh, and, and of assembly, permits us as citizens to then exercise our, uh, not only our rights, but our commitments. And so what you'll find in the UN 75 uh, People's Declaration are a number of commitments that we seek to uphold on our end to, um, well, uphold our commitments and rededicate ourselves to achieving the international agreements, to applying basic human rights and, and work on behalf of those left furthest behind and, and to advance these fundamental principles in, in our work, to raise our voices in the face of, of, of injustice, and then also to protect enhanced space for the participation of civil society uh, in the public square. So all of these together, we feel, um, outlines um, some of the key responsibilities uh, for us as um, individuals. Thank you, Jeff, for those, uh, those remarks. Uh, we've got a couple of other questions and I don't want to, to hog the floor, um, but I'll read those questions out and then maybe turn uh, to Bonnie to offer a couple of her, her responses uh, and then we will close the session. Um, so these questions that came up actually have a lot to do with implementation, which is, is really important. Um, so how can we inspire our fellow citizens to become the well-wishers of all mankind? And how can we get our political leaders to work for the good of humankind in its entirety? And a similar question is about this global civic ethic. How can we increase commitment to, to such an ethic grounded in the principle of human oneness among all people and organs of civil society and governments? And just my own two cents on both of these uh, questions is really that the, the solutions that we had been seeking, you know, very program-based, very material-based, I think are, are seeing their limits of effectiveness now. And we're seeing that, that relationships, that a more profound engagement uh, between human beings is actually uh, perhaps a deeper and in the long run, a more sustainable way to, to make some of these changes. And so while, you know, I don't hold the, the you know, the, the keys to the future or this imagination that it will, you know, we will magically have the perfect world even in my lifetime. I do hope that we can be starting on these processes that will, you know, one day build to greater momentum to be focusing more on the human element, the relationships, the profound connections that we have between each other and less the material transactions and the, and the, financial, uh, the financial transactions, important though they are, I don't mean to discount them, but they are not the sole source of development. And as we, we engage in these processes through conversations with our neighbors, through conversations with our government officials, it's like water over a rock where in time we'll see some, some evolution, but perhaps not right at the moment. And I think we have to become detached in a sense from, from that impact. So um, it means work as hard as we can, but I think it also means to stay strong in the face of adversity. So with that, I wanna just offer one more time my gratitude to all of you for joining us and hand the floor over to Bonnie for her uh, closing remarks, officially wrapping the bow on this launch event. Bonnie, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Len, and for asking and answering the question as well. And I just add a quote from Mahatma Gandhi who said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I know there was this question about 
how do we uh, inspire our fellow citizens? I think it is in the being and doing. And if each of us played our role, we would uh, inspire uh, our communities and then the nation and globally as well. We uh, share that inspiration. I thank you all for attending this session, which is not meant to be um, a singular event. We hope it's the beginning of a series of conversations which will trickle up and down and eventually be part of a movement of change to bring us to the centenary of the United Nations and a much more evolved world order characterized by equality, unity, lasting peace, and understanding among the governments and peoples of the world. In the words of Dr. Azakaram, we are all in this together and we thrive when we work together and the success of the UN and civil society is intertwined. And as Charlotte Bunch said, we can add music to the words and make a beautiful harmony together. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending this meeting. <laughs>